that. You're up. Start the stream and we should be good to go. Okay, let's do this. <clears throat> Turn my mic. Let's unmute everyone. <laughs> the producer, can you unmute that? There you go. Okay. <laughs> the producer is so budget on this show, Mark. I, I, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> uh, you're still having too much fun though. <laughs> How are you, brother? Good to see your face. I'm good. I'm good. I just, speaking of my face, I just arrived here Sunday and uh, in wonderful Ontario and Hamilton had the most beautiful day on Monday. So I'm holding a cannabis flag outside my employer's store uh, selling cannabis from and I'm outside from 10 to three in the afternoon without a hat. I just got burned terribly badly more than I've been in maybe a few decades. And uh, people say, well, you're a world traveler, aren't you used to sun? And I said, yeah, but equatorial sun in Colombia is a lot milder and gentler than a temperate. The further north you go, the harsher it is. If I was in the Arctic, I'd probably be peeling several layers <laughs> Um, if I'd have been out five hours in a row without a hat under the sun. So after that, I wore a hat and my problems were solved. Um, we've had such great weather Monday to Thursday. And now uh, where you are, St. Catharines, and where I am in London, it's raining. Yeah, uh, nothing grows without rain. We need it for the spring. But uh... there's truth to that. And all the cannabis growers I'm relying on to supply my brother and I shop. Because the reason I'm in Ontario is uh, my brother and I are opening a, a cannabis store together in London, Ontario, only a kilometer from where I was born and raised and where he was born and raised, my brother Matthew, and only two kilometers from where I started my legalization of cannabis campaign 30 years ago at the police station at London or at uh, Dundas and, and uh, Highbury, actually, or no, sorry, Dundas and Adelaide. And uh, I started giving out High Times magazines and Grow Guys because they were all banned back then. That was my first real crusade is to make books and magazines about marijuana legal. And I Took me three years, but we got that done in 1994. Wow, dude, dude, something just came to my mind. Do you know what's up with all the white mildew on the outdoor stuff these days? It seems like everyone's got it, and a lot of people went to seed this year too. Is it people that just don't know what they're doing growing? And well, when you say this year, no one in Canada is growing in March. 
uh, outside yeah, anyway. Right. Last uh, powdery, year. powdery mildew is much more controllable indoor in a way because you can control the humidity, you control the lights. Um, you can even have things that uh, destroy mold in your lighting. Uh, a lot of things you can do to prevent powdery mildew uh, or molds from forming indoors. Outdoors, if it's cloudy and cool and rainy for just three to four days, you're going to have powdery mildew. Really? Uh, anybody who's got it, I recommend a wonderful organic compound. It's just got six nutrients in it. Every ingredient is recognizable. The plants love it. You foliar spray it. It's called Jake's All-in-One. Mm. Jake's All-in-One. It's manufactured by a guy in Vancouver Island who's Families, probably third generation pot growers, they decided to get into grow products and uh, it's a wonderful product. Anyway, I grew 96 plants in Prince Edward County, not far from you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's north. It's on the other side of the lake, um, Prince Edward County. But uh, they uh, got powdery mildew, even though we had eight or nine fans. But with 96 plants in a greenhouse, you need to keep the air moving. Anyway, they got powdery mildew, and I applied Jake's all in one. I never saw powdery mildew again, and the plants really looked awesome. Um, and all organic, it's all no chemicals. And uh, you can only put stuff on, in my experience, though, when your plants are still in veg. Once you're flowering, right. uh, I, I would just cut off the leaves. I would just get rid of the leaves after that with powdery mildew. So what have you been up to since the last time we talked? I think it's a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe a year and a half. Well, once the, the COVID dictatorship took over in March, I, I stayed indoors like everyone else for 70 days. I didn't go out except groceries, but even then I had those delivered. I never went outside. All the parks were closed in Toronto anyway. It was kind of a ghost town. But after 70 days, I thought, no, something's all wrong here. This is ridiculous. They told me it was two weeks to flatten the curve. And now we'll never go back to normal until we've totally eradicated COVID and a vaccine's come in. And now over a year later, the dictatorship has just trampled on every charter right. Um, the government's inflated our currency so that in the years ahead, it will be greatly diminished in value. That's the only reason why stocks amidst the greatest recession ever are soaring upward. It's why housing prices are soaring upward, even though we have a lot of housing and a lot of people who can't afford it. Um, and so we're seeing the, de the devaluation of our currency. In fact, all worldwide currencies are getting devalued and uh, fiat currencies anyway, and all commodities are going up relative to cash. In fact, real estate is not going up in value. Money is going down in value. Stocks aren't going up in value. Money is going down in value. So everything else is holding its own while money goes down in value. This is going to be very bad for a lot of ordinary people who live from paycheck to paycheck when they see the cost of everything, food particularly, uh, going up. Anyway, I, I've been rebellious against the dictatorship ever since May 7th when I went down to Queen's Park in Toronto, the Capitol, the Parliament building, held up a sign that said, lockdown is over if you want it. I got like oh, threw stuff at me. One man came up and punched me. Um, I never have had such a, a hostile reaction in all my life to any political position I've ever taken. I've easily gotten more people uh, angry with me, threatening me, unfriending me, following me, sending me abuse, call me an asshole, jerk, fuck you, by the thousands uh, when it comes to COVID. Like people, and, and I'm, I, I, to anybody who's not corpulently fat, diabetic, or over 90, if you're under 90 and you're not diabetic or fat, you're not going to die. That's just it, right? If you smoke cigarettes, you're probably not going to die. If you smoke pot, you're absolutely not going to die. If you're under 65, you're not going to die. Well, I don't know why everybody's afraid of something that we already have so many diseases more likely to kill you. Number one would be suicide. I know four people who've killed themselves in the last year, and I don't know anybody who's died of COVID. Nobody in my social circle, nobody I've ever met died of COVID. No pot smoker I know died of COVID. And so we've literally destroyed the country as far as a free democracy, uh, a flourishing economy, uh, a normal economy. You know, we've, we've had a curfew in Montreal of 8 p.m. for over a month. It, it, that's dictatorial stuff, dictatorship stuff, because there are cops waiting everywhere. Any movement on the street, you're under arrest. Anybody leaving their home after 8 o'clock, you're under arrest. What kind of, this is Soviet Union stuff. And Canadians are just giving their freedom up and giving their charter rights up, giving their economy up because the government's given free money. Woohoo, free money did not work. Well, 
geez, you know, even a lot of pot smokers I know think that's great. Can't understand why I'm against that. They call that the ultimate stoner lifestyle. Get free money from the government, watch TV and smoke weed all day. Man, that's uh, it's a discouraging prospect for our country, especially with the communist Chinese, you know, so anxious to take over so much of the world by stealth or by bribery or by whatever. Um, you know, our, our Canadian youth are way too weak to, and too woke to resist the onslaught that's coming. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about how you view the handling of legalization. Um, my buddy's in the well, CBD business and it's flourishing in the States. Everyone's getting jumping on CBD. For those that don't know, it's non-psychoactive, doesn't get you high and it's got all these properties in it and he's gray market. Only a, only a license. Well, C- CBD, is le- CBD is legal in every state in the United States because it was never put on the schedule of controlled drugs and substances in the U.S. It's, because it's non-psychoactive, it was never really prohibited. It is um, prohibited in Canada except if you're a legal store. So the legal shop my brother and I are forming in here in, Can- in London, Emory Brothers Cannabis, will be selling CBD in all sorts of ways, drops and flowers and edibles and beverages. Um, but CBD is great if you've got anxiety, if you've got spasticity problems, but if you've got cancer or some serious disease, you're going to need full spectrum cannabis, meaning all parts of the cannabis plant resin, including THC. So CBD is great for some things, uh, but it has limitations. I, if you were doing some serious disease control like MS or cancer, I would get full spectrum cannabis and in very high doses too. Um, I, I could, there's reasons for that. Um, and the funny thing is I'm not allowed to tell people when they come into this shop, the medical use of cannabis. I can't tell them what it's good for. So if somebody comes up and said, I have MS, what would work best for me? I really can't tell them. I'll have to show them a book or something, get them to read that chapter. And then they can come back to me because I can't dispense medical advice. Right. right. Which is another one of the many nutty rules. But I get it. You know, I mean, you don't want to have charlatans claiming it'll cure your cancer just so they can sell you some weed oil. It does cure cancer sometimes. It will really help you if you're doing chemotherapy. Yeah. Uh, cannabis really assists well when you're doing chemotherapy. And there are other good things for chemotherapy, though. If you fast four days before you do chemotherapy, it's the best favor you could do yourself because cancer feeds on sugars and proteins. And if you can diminish the amount of sugar and protein in your body, before you start getting chemotherapy, then the chemotherapy is really effective on a weakened cancer um, cells throughout your body. There's, you're starving them of food. If you feed them, oddly enough, if you feed them, then they're going to resist that chemotherapy even more. So when people say they lose their appetite in a kind of a way, that's a good thing. Um, But you know, as as many of the, I can't, I cannot have that discussion with someone if they come into my store. It's, it's, uh, there's so many rules I don't like, but that having been said, um, it's still cool that 30 years after I started the campaign to legalize cannabis, that I, um, I have a legal cannabis shop with my brother, only a kilometer from where I was born and two kilometers from where I started the campaign. So for me, it, it's, you know, all things that are legal are regulated. And as a libertarian, I believe everything's regulated way too much. It's creating expense for the consumer. It's creating unnecessary expense for the business people, the cannabis producers, the retailers. Uh, it's, uh, it's probably hired a thousand bureaucrats since cannabis was legalized. The biggest bureauc- the biggest beneficiaries by far are the federal and provincial governments and their bureaucracies in Health Canada and the provincial health units because they've hired you know thousands more people to regulate us and we have to pay them with our revenues and stuff like that. So. Um, I had a more utopian vision of like individual freedom and wonderful, you know, pot people opening their own shops and stuff. But it's become something that only the elite and well healed um, can really afford and pull off. As a lot of regulation, there's bureaucracy. To open a store, you have to get approved at all four, three levels of government. That's a pain in the ass and expensive. So, you know, it's, it's I, do I regret having pot legalized? Sometimes I do, but once I get a handle on all these legal protocols and I've mastered it, I'll probably feel differently. Mm-hmm. You know, you talked about fasting before chemotherapy. There's so many things that uh, the public seems to be missing uh, access to as far as health goes. Uh, not too many people know CBDs and heart, heart and strokes uh, kill more like unbelievable amount of people in uh, North America. 
And the best stroke thing. is the leading cause of death. Stroke and heart disease is number one. Cancer is number two. Cancer might have superseded it. I tend to find more people these days getting cancer. Mm-hmm. My, although, unfortunately, strokes and heart disease run in my, my dad died of a stroke. And so did his father and his father. So to some degree, there's a genetic uh, predisposition, obviously, in my family towards it. Though when I got my DNA analyzed on 23andMe, it said I had no markers for a stroke or cancer. So that was interesting. Hmm. Um, it did tell me I didn't like cilantro, which is true. I detest cilantro. To me, it ruins a meal. <laughs> it, uh, I can tell you stuff like that. Strange it it also told me I don't time. have freckles. <laughs> I might look like I have freckles because I'm so sunburned, but uh, I know my nose is all harsh up. Anyway, that was stupid of me. You know, I'm used to being in the sun, mountain climbing and doing all sorts of things, you well, know, with sunblock and hats. And for some reason, the, and this is what I was getting to as far as uh, after the, the best thing. I don't know about the CBDs and the THCs, but the absolute best thing you can consume after a stroke or a heart attack is essential fatty acids, the industrial hemp oil. Yeah, well, probably I mean, omega threes. Yeah, you want omega threes. The, amino acids. Forget the medicine. That's the best thing you can get in you. And you know, I haven't heard the you know fast before chemo. But if I was going to recommend someone get uh, omega three, hemp seeds are a good source, a vegetable source. Halibut and salmon are probably your best bets, though. Mm-hmm. They have incredibly rich amounts of lysine, which is the healing amino acid. And omega-3, which is essential for life for so many reasons, it helps regulate your cannabinoid receptors. So halibut, salmon, cod's not bad for that either. Uh, Hemp seeds are rich in omega-3. So, yeah, there's lots to be said for just the non-THC, non-psychoactive, non-CBD, just straight oil that's derived from crushing the seeds. The cannabis plant's kind of a miracle plant if you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk to me about the interactions of the edibles, because a lot of people are experimenting with them now. And I know myself, even when I buy from a, you know, it, you know, it's a, it's an eyedropper full. I can take well, a- an eyedropper that you can buy legally is going to be a lot better than buying an edible. And the reason for that is you can buy like a thousand milligrams of CBD or a thousand milligrams of THC in a dropper. And that's one gram of pure extracted oil. Uh, it diluted in probably olive oil or some kind of oil like that. So you can take it in your mouth. And uh, yeah, if you buy an edible, you're limited just per package or per edible to 10 milligrams. So to get a thousand milligrams or one gram of pure oil, you would need to eat a hundred candies, a hundred brownies, hundred whatever. You're not going to do that. You're going to get diabetes if you eat that for a thousand milligrams, even over a week or two weeks, you just can't be eating that much sugar. And uh, so the problem is the legal market is at a standstill when it comes to beverages and edible products because they have capped the THC at 10%. And that's completely impractical. Nobody wants an edible of less than 50 milligrams. Medical people need it 100, 200, 300, 500 milligrams uh, in a cookie. So that is inadequate to deal with the market demand. And so that needs to be changed. So beverages and edibles aren't very good at jurisdiction, but cannabis flour, cannabis extracted oil, um, pens with oil, um, droppers with CBD oil, those are great. You can get uh, you know anything up to a thousand milligrams, which is not even exceeded in the free market. They don't have the products more than that. So the government regime is good for three fifths of products and not so good for two fifths of product. But those regulations will improve, albeit too slowly. But they will. The, the bureaucracy responds um, the, to the market uh, slowly and uncertainly, but it does happen. I'm more interested in your take on how the in, there must be different interactions with, I don't know, fat in your diet. Well, I know there's probably an alcohol consideration, but for instance, like the first time I got my father some to try out because he's got you know some issues that it should take care of, I took a whole eyedropper full. And I think it was kind of just in the background. I could feel it, but it was just kind of in the background for me. CBD or tr- full spectrum oil? Full uh, THC. It had very little CBD. And you took a whole dropper? Oh, an, uh, one dropper. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what's no, what's uh, the total? Whole, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was 30 milligram bottles. I was buying it from spec, um, some of the big whatever. Sounds like that would be about 300 milligrams of THC. That's a fair bit. I, I'd be surprised if you could take that without feeling something. No, well, here's the thing. The first time it was just in the background. Uh, the next time I had a beer and a spliff and I greened out 
I had to lay down. And then the next time I took it, nothing. So I was like, look, you know, like I, I don't usually drink. Yeah, that's that's eat, tough. But... That's tough to understand. At no it's point did you seem to even get high because. because getting sick after the alcohol isn't necessarily being high. Greening out just means getting sick. So it means it interacted poorly with how you were. Um, gee, two out of three of those were no effect and one out of three was getting sick. So here's what I would recommend. Why would you? Why do you want to take it? What's the purpose? What did you want it to achieve? Well, uh, I've got serious pain issues. Uh, I hope it would yeah. help with that. And then, by the way, for the let's mental- stop there. Let's stop there. What's wrong with Advil for pain for you? Oh, I take that too. And does it work? Mm, it, it, it knocks it off a little bit. I mean, I've got huh. I've got tons because of- because cannabis stuff. is only really good for certain kinds of pain. Okay. I've always found that Advil and and, and Tylenol are terrific for pain generally. They're miracle drugs in a lot of ways. Um, and cannabis is good for the kind of pain that comes from, uh, that you get from multiple sclerosis when you have spasticity disorders. Or, But I haven't noticed it's been good for uh, muscle pain quite that much or chronic pain. It's good for certain kinds of pain. So I'm not surprised, by the way, um, you should come and see me in the week <laughs> and, uh, and try some 100 milligram pure cannabis oil uh, capsules and, uh, and try those and try one at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, see if you sleep and see if you, see if you sleep pain free. And then you'd experiment by taking one during the day because I have, you know, I'm curious to know how you react. And basically what you got to do is keep experimenting yeah. because although there's a lot of anecdotal things, the thing about cannabis as a therapeutic uh, medicine or substance or is that each person will have a different reaction, a different response, because we all have different illnesses, pains. Nothing is really quite the same. Like if I have a back pain and you have back pain, it doesn't mean our back pain is caused by the same circumstance, situation or problem. Yours might be neurological. Mine might be muscular. I might have a spinal problem, a disc problem. Oftentimes pain in a certain area, it doesn't originate from that area. It originates from some other place and the pain is prominent there because there's either a lymph node, a neurologically sensitive area, or any number of things. Um, so again, you're going to need to have an open mind experiment and then some things might go wrong. You might green out like you did, but I would never mix alcohol with pot until you've got it thoroughly understood and under control. Yeah, I've got a buddy of mine give me some gummies that came from one of the stores down here. because. Uh, okay, when you say stores... Do you mean legal stores? Because no gummy yeah. from a legal store is going to do too much to you. Oh. Whereas flour uh, extracts and pens and uh, oils and drops from a legal store can be very strong. Oh. But from the black market is where you would get edibles that are much higher in strength. I'm hoping that gets changed soon for the legal market. But um, And, you know, to me, edibles either do nothing or they're too strong. Yeah. I, I rarely have that perfect moment where That's my bot i have had it though so i know what i know what the target is i know what the goal is i know what happens when it works you feel awesome and blissful and totally serene and relaxed and you know but that's only like 20 percent of the time like the other 40 percent, i don't feel anything in, and 20 30 percent, i can feel too much and i've got to lie down so <laughs> edibles to me are tricky um a lot of times the best thing to do is make your own like make 20 brownies. Uh, it's easy to make them all the same dose. And then you can cut them in various sizes and portions. So you have a pretty good idea of how much you're consuming. You'll develop a tolerance to it. If you use it to go to sleep, yeah. you'll, you can start out at 80 milligrams brownie and go to sleep. And probably in three weeks, you'll need 200 milligrams. Wow. Because I, I found it, it, I had to keep raising the dosage huh. uh, every week to, to see it work. I remember the first time I tried it, I'm like, oh, no, I've been you know, a smoker for years. This is no problem. I had one of my mother's cookies that she used. She had when she was dying of cancer. And uh, I'm like, give me one of those. And I ate it. And for 45 minutes, I was spinning on the couch. I'm like, what is this? But I was drinking mm. too, right? So, okay, once you're, spin- once you're spinning, you're, you're going to throw up. You because uh, it, the greening out creates dizziness. Once you're dizzy, you're going to throw up. Because when you lose your balance, you get nauseous. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've had it happen. I've greened out 14 times in my life. So when people say you can't overdose on pot, no, you can overdose. You're just not going to die. Well, you know what, Mark? Uh, and and nothing, nothing is going to be in danger. No organs are going to collapse. Like with alcohols. 
like alcohol can kill you right now. I mean, when people criticize cigarettes, they say, oh, cigarettes will kill you. Yeah, they will, but they'll kill you in 30, 40 years, whereas alcohol can kill you this afternoon. Um, if you drink too much and get in a car, just kill your, you know, like about eight to 10,000 people die every year of just organ failures from alcohol, psoriasis, sclerosis of the liver, a variety of ailments. And then not to mention the accidents on, on the road, the accidents on the job. And, you know, alcohol is extremely problematic for bank robberies and a variety of other antisocial behavior. So, you know, alcohol can kill you today um, and influence you to hurt someone. But as tobacco is more benign, you know, that'll kill you. It's probably not going to kill you. You probably won't create criminogenic behavior. You're not going to get violent like you might on alcohol or personality changes or schizophrenia or aggression. So, you know, there's different ways to die and different timetables of death and different ways to die. Um, I would suggest we all try and uh, practice uh, conscious longevity and avoid tobacco and alcohol as much as possible. And of course, you know, I just had a wonderful friend of mine of 25 years just die suddenly. And he had you know, cancer and metastasis all acro across his body. And from the time he first had stroke-like symptoms, he died within three weeks after from this cancer that was putting pressure on his brain and what have you. But I love the guy, but he was my age. And, you know, when I started working with him 25 years ago, he would he put his hand to his forehead and said he gets terrible cluster headaches and, uh, you know, worse than migraines. He said just terrible. Can't, and they don't go away for half an hour to an hour. But I had been watching him and I'd never seen him eat a vegetable. And he drank Coca-Cola and coffee all day long. And I said, Greg, do you ever drink water? He said, because, you know, headaches are caused by dehydration and you drink Coca-Cola, you do coffee. You're draining all the water out of your system with diuretics and you smoke cigarettes a pack a day. You smoke cannabis. It's all drying you out. Dehydration, dehydration, drying you out, pissing all your water out. That's why you've got all these headaches. And he said, you know, you're probably right. Never saw him drink water in the next 25 years. Never saw him cut back on cigarettes. Never saw him eat a, eat a vegetable. And he continued to drink coffee and Coca-Cola to the day he died. So my good friend, Greg, whom I adore and love, was the master of his fate. He died of his own hand. He chose the way he wanted to go. He kept smoking, knowing it was bad for him. He kept eating the wrong foods, knowing it was bad for him. He drank the wrong beverages, knowing it was bad for him. He wasn't particularly surprised when he was struck ill with things, you know, that are exacerbated by bad diets, bad habits, and in improper living. He died at age 64. So, you know, like, uh, you know, I love the guy, but we all have to be conscious. We usually die of our own hand. There are very few things where we can say his life was taken unexpectedly with, no, you know, against his will, like by a car hit him. Uh, someone shot him. Uh, he was kidnapped. You know, those things rarely happen. Mostly we die by our own excesses. Whatever we do stupidly, too much of, un you know, uncaringly, that's what's going to kill us. That's true with everything. Most of the bad things that happen to us are our own fault. You know, we are our own worst enemies. And we live in an era where everybody wants to blame everybody else for their problems. You know, so they blame whiteness. They blame males. They blame straight heterosexual older men. Uh, for, you know, we have some magical power that, you know, exceeds all other natural things. And, uh, you know, people are trying to embrace a cult of victimhood to justify and rationalize uh, why they don't have the success that they want in their life. Same with, uh, you know, the amount of obesity. We, you know, we, the, thing, the way, the best way not to get COVID, along with washing your hands, is to stay healthy. Eat well, sleep well, and cut back on food you don't need and stop junk food. But instead, in the last year, everybody's added 15 pounds on average. They've gotten unhealthier, so they're more vulnerable to COVID because they're bigger, and obesity is the number one comorbidity, although it's generally very obese, grotesquely obese, you know, body mass indexes of 40, 50 pounds more than normal minimum uh, to really show uh, some signs of COVID susceptibility. But nonetheless, you know, this would have been a good time for the government instead of coming down like a dictatorship to tell everybody get outside, get vitamin D, get some sun, keep thin, eat good food, eat fresh food, don't be eating crap, don't sit at home and use our free money to buy Lay's potato chips which might be the worst thing you could possibly have, along with candies and sugars. Diabetes is the number two comorbidity after obesity, and they all give you that. So here we are putting on 15 extra pounds, probably carbs, probably sugar, getting ourselves more unhealthy and getting more prone to being vulnerable to COVID. 
right, as a result of these government lockdowns. And so we have the exact wrong approach. We, you know, if I was the premier, I would have just said, people, we're going to lose a few, right? If you are vulnerable, please stay at home. Please wash your hands. Please stay six feet away from everybody you meet, including your children, your grandchildren. But you can coexist in the same sphere, but they might bring it home. And candidly, we're not going to lock down any, any places. We're not closing any stores. We're telling people to distance, to wear masks, but we're not making it law. We're not mandatory. We're not going to have a dictatorship. You are responsible for your own health. And therefore, if you're over 85 and you're obese and you're diabetic, then you are very vulnerable and you should take all the precautions you can and everybody else just be considerate. And that's it, folks. That's the only thing we're doing as a government. There's no free money. We're not closing anybody down you know, you're going to have to cope and you're going to have to look after your family and your friends and do the best thing you can do to keep healthy. And that would be my, my speech as premier at five minutes long. And that would be the only one. There would be no daily updates, you know, of deaths and how many cases and what have you. We'd make vaccines available as fast as possible. And we wouldn't stop travel. We wouldn't stop trade. We wouldn't do anything. That's what a rational, constitutionally uh, rational government would do under the Charter of Rights. This business that you can't travel, that you can't leave your home after eight o'clock, that you can't meet with your family, these are insane and absurd and illegal and unconstitutional and the, a, a classic dictatorship kind of authoritarianism. So that's all unacceptable. I'm hoping to run in the next election as a People's Party's candidate here in oh, London. I was in, just going to say, what are your well, I, aspirations? I, I Somebody I called you a liberal it. hack the other day because you supported Justin Trudeau. And then I'm like, oh, once, a once in my life and you never fit, live it down. I think that was See, the last time around. You were a max guy, too. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Last election, that, I wanted to run. I want to run here in London. Fanshawe be a good way to introduce the brand, too. I go door to door and say, I'm Mark Emery. Though, and then you, they can say, what do you do, Mr. Emery? And I say, I help run Emery Brothers with my brother, Cannabis yeah. there. So at least everybody I knock on a door or meet. I can tell them about the shop, the right? I mean, that's the only good thing you're going to get out of an election because they're very unsatisfying. Right. People won't vote for you. <laughs> you know, they're going to support the dictatorship, right? That's what the, all but, four parties. It's like a party dictatorship. They all agree. Nobody in Parliament is opposing any of these measures. They would. They, they wouldn't even have done it differently. The NDP and Liberals, uh, NDP and Greens probably would have done it even worse. But you can't beat how badly the conservatives in Ontario at the provincial level have done. And you'd be hard pressed to be more of a communist than Trudeau. So, you know, running for the People's Party, I'm going to say basically it's us versus them, the dictatorship versus the People's Party, because we're the only opposition to all this authoritarian dictatorship nonsense that's that's making life so miserable here in Canada. Well, uh... but I don't know. I think that election is actually not coming. If we were going to have a May election, it would have been called now, whereas they don't really have elections in June, July and August. Uh, and so I think you're looking at a fall election. And I think Trudeau would want an election after everybody's vaccinated, everybody. Anyway, that people probably think they're so grateful to him that, you know, they would vote for the government in, in October. So we'll see. Um, by then, hopefully Matt and I are just working away, having a good time selling cannabis legally and doing our thing. And if an election's called in October, that'll be fine. Are you open now? What, are you open now? When you... No, we, the bureaucracy, we've been ready since September, but we need uh, the Ontario AGCO, which is the Alcohol Gaming Cannabis Office, to give us an authorization date to open. And then at that point, we have, a, 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 we have some construction that we're waiting for City Hall to give us a permit to, because with the lockdown, these things have been delayed. Um, so I'm hoping we open in May, but I suspect it's going to be June or July. Uh, in the meantime, I'm working with friends at a legal cannabis shop in Hamilton. I'm basically an apprentice. I'm learning how the legal industry works, the protocols, uh, the, the technology, uh, inventory systems, control systems, the regulations, storage systems. Um, there's a, a bank, banking. There's a lot to learn. So I'm learning so that when Matt gets his authorization date from the AGCO, um, we're ready to get into gear. And hopefully we'd be opening four to six weeks after that. But yeah, you'll you'll know. You're in okay, St. Catharines, you'll hear. Yeah, I'll come up and see you. What's your product lineup going to look like? Well, it'll look a lot like what we have at Toke. Uh, you're, there's a Toke in St. Catharines, by the way, and I'll probably be working there in the future. They'll probably have me at all the locations. But there's a Toke in St. Catharines. You can even go online to um, tokecannabis.ca. 
um, and you'll find there's a Toke St. Catharines and just look at their menu. It changes every Friday. Uh, new material arrives Friday. And of course, as we sell it through the week, the websites are changed and you can get a very good idea of prices. There'll be 150 items on that website. Um, just the number of pre-rolls. So if you just wanted to buy a joint, a big, huge gram and a half pre-roll uh, for $15 or a one gram one for $10 approximately, or a half gram one for about six to $8 then uh, there's like 25 different kinds. It's, it's really an extraordinarily good lineup. Um, there's over 600 licensed producers producing cannabis. There's over, a, a, you could stock a thousand different products in a legal cannabis store and you wouldn't quite have everything. So there's an enormous potential inventory for any store. There's an awful lot for the clients to buy. You have to keep competitive though, because they can always buy it online from the Ontario Cannabis Store, they're the people really making the big money, is the Ontario government monopoly on the distribution of cannabis to retail stores. And that's what keeps our margins tight because you can't really mark it up too much without going above the government's retail price. And, you know, in the long run, people will not shop at your place if you're, you know, uh, or trying to get too much out of it. So tight margins, you, to break even at the shop I'm working at now in Hampton, you need to sell $3,250 a day. That's a lot to sell just to break even, to pay your staff, mm -hmm. to pay your inventory and to cover your rent. I, I was pretty shocked. I thought people were making bank in this industry and you got to hustle for that. Now, my brother and I, and my, uh, one of my sons, we're, we're going to try and do all the work here. We'll work 12 hour days until we get a sense of the, you know, the volumes, how many people, I mean, if worse comes to worse, I could run this shop myself or run to the front door, check their ID. If there's nobody else here, uh, say, come and look at our sign. You know, I can recommend some things. I'll get it for you. You know, and just tell anybody else to wait at the front door for me once they come in. Right. I mean, if you had to, you don't really need more than one, two or three people until you got like lots of people, but our, our anteroom where people come into our store under COVID, there you probably could only put three to four people there tops. And that's the maximum we'd allow in at 50% of our regular capacity, where you might have eight to 10 to 12 uh, in, the, in, the, in the lobby area. So, you know, uh, as these regulations diminish, as COVID diminishes, you know, we can have more people in, but you know, there will be times and probably we'll have a lineup outside just like, I hope we will, just like I did at my free market shop, Cannabis Culture, five years ago on Church Street, where we served 2000 people a day and had a lineup of 25 in the store and up to 20, 25 people outside the store. And I was proud because it only took me 14 minutes to complete a lineup of 25 people. So you could get from the back of that lineup to the front within 12 minutes. And we've got to be that quick here. Uh, and as people come into the store, they'll look at our screens and hopefully they'll decide what they want so that when I see them at the counter, they already know what they want. The transaction maybe takes two to five minutes, um, you know, between credit cards and debit cards and cash and putting it in and telling them a spiel and giving them a little bit of advice uh, on consumption. You know, like hopefully uh, with two of us at a counter, we'll go through it pretty quick. But basically, this is a it's not a mom and pop. It's a brother and brother operation. You know, we're not looking to be rich. We're looking to have a little fun. We're looking to be self-sufficient. We're looking to make a little history since we grew up so close nearby. This is my hometown where my legalization campaign started three years or uh, 30 years ago. So, you know, it's nice to come full circle at the latter stages of my life. My brother and I probably got 10 or 20 good years left if all goes well. And it'd be nice to end it here in London, you know, doing the kind of thing that we only visualized or dreamt about 30 years ago. Well, what's it uh, legalization done to the gray market and how does that affect legal sales? I mean, back in the day, I'm buying stuff at the store. Well, I'm not, but my buddies are buying really quality tasting stuff. I don't know what's in this. Oh, yeah. Quality Listen, stuff Canada is one of the greatest jurisdictions in the world for high quality yeah, cannabis. They're paying like Ontario, a Ontario less so. Most of the really great Canadian weed still comes from British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, at but the store, that the having been said, the free market has incredible stuff but the legal market has quickly uh, closed in on that both price wise and quality wise but I, I will tell you there's a lot of fabulous pot grown in Canada um, but my job see when we open when Matt and I open Emory Brothers here in May or June uh, we're going to have to steal all our clients from some other entity in other words everybody in Canada who wants cannabis is already getting it 
So when I open my doors here, I've got to take those customers we're going to get from existing legal shops where people are going to or the, the black market shop, uh, dealers. So the street dealer, the illegal dispensary, the legal shop, I've got to see what we can do to take people from those uh, destinations and bring them to us. And uh, hopefully my reputation, my historical uh, contributions to cannabis legalization, um, and the fact that I'm from London uh, will engender uh, uh, people to drive here and drive by other shops that sell cannabis just so they can come here and support the people who help make it legal, um, the people who grew up here, the people who are doing it for the love of cannabis and to make an ordinary normal living and, and not to exploit it by all, like all these corporations are who never grew pot, never contributed to legalization, had nothing to do with it. Um, we're all from lumber and mining and sports medicine and nutraceuticals and all this sort of stuff. And because their money was clean, um, they can get into the cannabis business, but they got no love for it. They have no passion. Mm. They, to them, it's all a financial venture. So hopefully people will come and support Matt and I and my son, Jeremy, as we work here and, uh, and uh, help us make a go of it. Yeah, how do you, how do you compete though when the, the the market price seems to be going through the floor? I mean, even black market stuff well, price was always two hundred bucks an ounce. Now you can buy and, and, every, and everything's come down because the country has a surplus of cannabis. There's so much legal production. There's over six hundred legal producers now, and and of course the 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 market demand for cannabis was already met before any of these legal producers came on. For whatever the market wants the demand is met. So there were already enough black market growers, medical growers who are selling their surplus to the, uh, in the black market, the illegal market. And there was no shortage. There was never a shortage when, you know, you were buying, everybody was buying illegally. So now you take that supply, add it to the legal supply, which is probably the equivalent of hundred to 200 football fields of cannabis being harvested every month, add that to the supply that was already adequate and you have a surplus and you have a glut. So the price in the legal market has come down great. The price on the black market is coming down. Whoa, it's hugely dropped. We've got all these bargains out there. Um, it's going to be hard for people to make money. And half the, half the legal shops that are going to be open by the end of this year will be out of business within two to three years. If you're paying too much rent to your two stock or your shareholders are expecting more money than is reasonably going to be predicted, People are going to get antsy and they're wanting, going to want to liquidate their position and get out. And so we're going to see at the end of this year, way too many cannabis shops. London will have 25 to 35 to 40. It's not sustainable. Wow. But my brother and I, if we do most of the work and meet people ourselves, we'll develop loyalty with our clients in the neighborhood. <clears throat> we're surrounded by a big residential area. We're on an art arterial road. I am quite confident that no matter how much of a glut in the market there will be, my brother and I, and my son will be able to carve out enough of a market that we can do okay ourselves, the three of us, and maybe a few helpers. But, you know, this is not a large location, and I like that. It's a very homey, cozy location. We don't need a lot of people. We don't have grand ambitions to have a chain of 50. I can't think of anything more boring, because we'll probably have to have investors and people who will be putting pressure on us to get stuff done their way. And, you know, I know how everybody else who has partners with investors is always under pressure to make more money. Um, and I don't want to do that. I want to have the pressure to make enough to afford to cover my family, uh, to cover my obligations. I have back taxes to pay. I have a fine that I have to finish paying. Uh, I've got obligations that I need to work on that can only be done with a job that pays me a reasonable amount. I can't even own the business. I just work for my brother but hopefully he'll be generous minded in paying me um, because uh, with a criminal record for cannabis, I'm not allowed to own a cannabis store. Right. Go figure that. I haven't even been given my manager's license. I applied nine months ago. It's already over their legal limit of time. They have to take before they tell me because they, you know, they're, they haven't given it to me because of my extensive criminal record for cannabis. Now, a lot of people I know, including my former partners, Chris, Aaron, Brittany, everybody I know with a criminal record has still gotten their manager's license. I'm the only one that doesn't. Now, worse comes to worse, my brother, he has no criminal record, so he can use money. He can get a manager's license. He can be an owner, and that's great. And I'll work for him. And that's fine. I, you know, I'll do whatever I can to make it work. 
brother. Uh, if that's your home riding, man, imagine in a couple election cycles, uh, stranger things have happened. You could be elected to the House, dude. Can you- I, I, I'm really, I'm an unelectable guy. I routinely get called, and these aren't these aren't true accusations, oh, but I'm routinely that. called homophobic, transphobic, anti-masker, anti-vaxxer, that's anti-lockdown. All you need um, is one riding to love you, and you're in. Look at I'm an, look I'm anti I'm an, anti anti woke all these things right like I've become so conservative in my old age I'm so shocked I I totally support Christians and their right to open and go to their churches to worship even though I'm an atheist I'm very worried that we've been taking a hard line against Christians and religious people right I mean our constitution starts out with like we're one nation under God right so the government says we can keep costco open but you got to close your church i don't think that's that's not obeying the spirit of our charter of rights or our constitution at all right costco gets like primo consideration but joe's diner down the street or the god forbid the church or the kids playing on a pond are all illegal arrest them all no no this we've got a dictatorship and it's appalling that it's supported by the majority of canadians by far Dude, I want to keep you on time. Uh, do you sell hemp hydrosol yet? Somebody comments here on Facebook. Listen, I don't even know what that is. Hydra means water. Sol hydrosol, means sun. Yeah, I think it's so. It's the, the res. What's left after they take the THC and the CBDs out of it, maybe in the water. Hamilton. Well, who'd want that? What good is that? Mm-hmm. Like, what would you use that for? And why would you bother? Why not just? I don't know. What, what is it? What is it for? I don't know. I'll follow up with you. Hamilton okay, we'll do that in the next show. Maybe we can do one live from the story when we're open. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, that'll bro. be so fun. It's almost three fifty. I promised you I keep you on time, so thank you. For hey, thanks, time. Jimmy. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you soon, man. It's been an awesome. And, yeah, let's. Uh, it's Emery Brothers Cannabis at at seven two five Hamilton Road in London. We're open to open in May and June. Uh, please come and say hello to my brother and I. Uh, come buy some cannabis. And uh, in the meantime, I'm working at Tote Cannabis in Hamilton at uh, 247 uh, Centennial Parkway in Barton. I'm there Monday to Thursdays. Um, you might see me with the flag because I don't have to wear a mask if I hold the flag outside. Um, but it's not so terrible. I'll also be inside serving customers and learning the ropes and uh, trying to make the best of my time. All right. Your internet's just starting to cackle, but we got through it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your time. Okay. We'll you hey, all right. Thanks, man. See you, Jim. Right. Cheers. bye jim later brother i appreciate it there he goes he's out all right so, oh, oh my gosh this is too big too 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 bright too big you're too big jim thanks to mark emery i guess i'm oh i guess i just left the room but i'm still in the zoom call um wow guy can carry a conversation Anyways, Tuesday, March 30th, 4 p.m. right here at Mayor Jim Dimmy, Jimmy D. Tuesday, next Tuesday, that's March 30th. Can you believe that? It's going to be April already. 4 p.m. EST right here, the Mayor of Niagara Falls, Jim D. Adati. And the next day on the 31st, I got Matea Murda. We're going to talk about her work at the UN and sex, se- sex selective abortions. Do you know that, you know, young Female unborn babies get killed in Canada because they're female. My body, my choice. <laughs> if you oppose that, you hate women. Yeah, well, what about killing them? That ain't good. Reynolds, thanks for uh, chirping in, man. Uh, I will call you when I get out of here. And, uh, well, thanks for watching. Share it if you like it. Comment if you don't. Tell me how much you hate me. I'm good with that. Uh, YouTube. It's called True Tube or the Jim Fannin Show. Otherwise, I'm Jim Fannin or Jim Fannin Show everywhere else on the, on well, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Gab, MeWe, Insta, LinkedIn, TikTok, Telegram, Parler, Twitter, Clubhouse, Signal, PayPal, Patreon. All of it will be at True.Tube. You'll get some clips, maybe some promo stuff, but the good stuff like this, will be at true.tube and I won't have to need social media or any YouTube streaming process or anything like that. So 
All right. I am out of here. Peace, love, hug your neighbor. And for crying out loud, take that fucking mask off your beautiful face.